how is this going to look? So, I will start by giving a little bit of an introduction to the BSHR, um, what we're about, what we do, how to get involved, um, and then I will pass on to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Tom Sinclair. Um, after that, we will have a moderated Q&A um, with audience participation, so start thinking about your questions, guys. Um, and following that, we will have some refreshments and drinks and a chance to have a chat amongst yourselves and with the committee. <coughs> okay, so who are we? So Broad Street Humanities Review is Oxford's only undergraduate humanities journal. So we are the only opportunity that undergraduates have to write and to publish um, for a review for a journal here. Um, we want to create a space where ideas that maybe don't come up so much in tutorials uh, can be explored and can be written about. Um, we're really excited to deliver this and of course, uh, as you can all tell, we're also running a series of quite exciting workshops on resistance. Um, these workshops are really designed to kind of flesh out that broad theme um, to give you guys a little bit of context as to what that theme entails and how different disciplines approach it as well. Um, so we think it's a really interesting thing to get involved in. Um, we hope that this isn't the last time that we see you because we have three more workshops running um, during the term. And yeah, so we're really excited. Uh, it's good to see you all here. So just a little bit more about how all of you can get involved. So at the moment, um, <coughs> we are looking for a committee member. We're still looking for a design officer. Um, if anyone's interested in that sort of thing, uh, please speak to the committee at the end of our presentation. Um, in the near future, we have two uh, position, positions opening. One is for co-editor, so that will be on a termly basis if you want to edit the BSHR. Um, applications will open Monday of week three. Um, on the other hand, if you'd like to write, which is of course what we're all about, uh, calling for pictures beginning Monday of week three, um, the deadline for those pictures is Friday of week six, and by pictures I mean about two to three hundred words um, about an idea that you'd like to write about to the BSHR. Um, so this is a really good opportunity um, for you to potentially publish an article. Um, once pictures are chosen, um, writers will have until the end of ninth week, so Saturday of ninth week, to write their full journal article. Um, here I just also talked about perhaps why uh, is worth getting involved. So obviously we're a new society, um, that's pretty exciting. Uh, it's really cool to be part of a society kind of as it happens. I mean, um, our roller banner that we've got here arrived today. Uh, we picked it up about an hour and a half ago. So this is really new, uh, really kind of vibrant. Everyone on committee is a founding member um, and you could be part of that first initial drive. Um, obviously, it's great for academic, non-academic CVs, obviously. Um, just thought I'd slip that in. Um, and also two other things that I haven't mentioned on here because three circles look better than five. Um, so we're looking for college reps at the moment um, for your colleges so that you can kind of spread the word about the BSHR, share some of the events that we have, um, and let other people know about it. Um, and of course, you can just also become a BSHR member. Um, all you have to do for now is um, sign yourself up to a mailing list, um, which will be in that computer over there. So after the event, you can all go um, and do that. So just thought for reference, we've got our turn card here. I know it might be a little bit difficult to see at the back, but um, obviously today we've got resistance and philosophy with Dr. Tom Sinclair, uh, and in week four, so our next workshop will be um, on resistance and ideas and experiences with Professor Abigail Williams and um, Dr. Lucy Wooding. Um, so definitely recommend turning up to that, and we've got events in week five and week six as well. Uh, if you sign up to the mailing list, you'll never miss any of them. Um, I will be regularly pestering you with emails, and that's a promise. Okay, um, so... Now, I'd like to move on to introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Tom Sinclair has been at Wadham since September 2013 as a tutorial fellow in philosophy. Um, he writes on political philosophy and ethics, and is particularly interested about questions about the authority of political rule, the nature of justice and injustice, 
and the relation between political authority and justice. In 2017, Dr. Sinclair won Outstanding Tutor in the Oxford University Union Teaching Awards, very prestigious. And I'd just like to mention that Dr. Sinclair's interest in resistance is not purely academic. In fact, he's been heavily involved in Extinction Rebellion and was among the people arrested in April as part of the Extinction Rebellion protests in London. And before anyone asks, Dr. Sinclair did give me permission to mention that. Um, so today, Dr. Sinclair will be talking about the possibility of legitimate injustice and its implications for political resistance. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tom Sinclair. Sorry? Do you want me to do slides here? No, I'm happy to, because yeah. if I stand here, I'll be in the way of them, so I need to be out of the way anyway. That's very good. Thanks, thanks for inviting me, um, and is, is that important? It's a phone. Sorry? Is this recording or something? Or should I be no, no. Oh, it's oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so the... the um, Broad Street Humanities Review looks like a great uh, initiative, and I'm delighted to be invited to speak to you all. Um, uh, Anthony explained to me that um, they tried several other people, um, but they all turned him down, so I'm sorry. I'm, I'm delighted to be the consolation prize, um, and I'm very flattered to be described as uh, distinguished Dr. Sinclair over and over again, although mainly today I'm distinguished by my shabby clothes. Sorry about that. Um, so. I was asked to uh, come and talk to you in a way that might um, spur some ideas for writing um, and to and to introduce you to some of the, the ways that a political philosopher such as myself might approach questions about resistance. So that's what I propose to do here. Um, what I'm going to do is briefly describe to you the kind of um, analytical philosophical philosophical approach that is uh, mostly what people do around here who are philosophers um, and then I'm going to apply that approach to questions about resistance um, and uh, having done that describe to you some a couple of puzzles about political resistance in particular um, and with any luck you'll solve them which will put me out of a job but that's fine um, but you took, you took my interests, the list of my interests from, from the website, which I updated about five years ago. Um, they, they've changed since then. Um, okay. So, among other things, um, what philosophers do, what professional philosophers do anyway, is try to trace the contours of um, our thought, and that that hour is, um, is vexed about... It's, it's not totally clear who the hour is supposed to be, and it's not totally clear that when one says our thought, one isn't doing something slightly dodgy already. But in general, they try to trace the concepts of thought they take to be shared by themselves and others. And they try to understand that thought, um, sometimes as an end in itself, sometimes with a view to critique or to vindication. So, um, <coughs> so one traditional preoccupation of analytic philosophy has been uh, problems about questions about knowledge and whether we have it or not of various things, and typically the the, the program is not critical. The program is vindicatory. So the idea is to, to show that we really do know some stuff. Um, of course, there are some very famous skeptics who founded and concluded that we don't know anything. But the majority of people engaged in that project are engaged in the project of showing why we do. And in moral philosophy and in political philosophy, things are very much the same. Um, people tend either to be trying to vindicate patterns of thought, patterns of moral thinking and practice that uh, we sh they take us to share, or they try to critique those practices and perhaps suggest ways in which they might be improved. Um, and to do this well, and I don't claim to do it well, but I know what it looks like when people do, to do this well, you need to have a good feel for existing practices, for uh, social norms and conventions, for you have to be, as it were, inculcated into the tradition of morality around here, or at least um, with those people who are your intended audience. You have to be decent at distinguishing maybe only subtly different concepts. You, know, um, 
you have to be uh, logically reasonably rigorous uh, and you have to have a decent awareness of other ways things might be, ways that might not occur to you if you just rush headlong down the normal tracks of thought that you're used to. Um, so it calls for some creativity and imagination. It's a, it, it can be, and often is written as if it's an incredibly sterile, formal business philosophy, but it can be pretty delightfully creative. Um, and now I'm not going to do anything delightfully creative for you here today. I'm going to do much more along the formal, boring stuff. But um, I, want, I hope that the things I say will suggest to you uh, roots that might spur delightful creativity in, in you. So um, the, 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 the actual practice of writing a philosophical, a philosophical thing, a, a, an article or a book or a, a, an article for a journal, for example, um, is going to involve identifying a puzzle or a tension in moral or political thought, if, if, if moral or political philosophy is what you're interested in, and then giving an argument of some sort to the effect that those tensions are real tensions or that they can be dissolved, that those puzzles are insoluble or difficult or interesting or that, in fact, they're illusory and easily solved or that they're very difficult but you've solved them, something like that. Um, and what I'm going to do is uh, talk about the theme of resistance with a view to bringing out puzzles of that sort. Um, but I'm going to, and I'm going to proceed largely by adopting the methods of analytic Anglophone political philosophy. They're the ones I was trained in. That's the stuff that's, as it were, the bread and butter of both of teaching around here and also research around here. Um, but I'm going to end by raising a few doubts about those methods. Okay. So here's a is a almost comically um, <coughs> anglophone philosophical thing to do. What is resistance? Now I'm going to do some ordinary language analysis. I'm going to say, at the most general level, resistance is something like opposing some force, right? So, at the very, at the, in a very, the most general analysis of resistance takes it to be a concept having to do with opposition. Right? You don't, if there's nothing to oppose, then you, there's no resistance. But of course, we're not here to do um, general lexicography um, and analysis at that level. We're more interested in interpersonal forms of resistance. And so at the most general interpersonal level, I think I want to say that resistance involves some form of non-acquiescence, um, in particular, perhaps either involving placing of external obstacles in the way of what somebody else is trying to get you to do or wants you to do, or placing internal obstacles, mental obstacles, so things like resolutions not to change your mind about something can be a form of resistance, right, at the interpersonal level. So you can, you can, um, you can have somebody haranguing you trying to get you to change your mind about something and you can smile benignly and not put up any external resistance, but nevertheless know in your heart that there's no way you're changing your mind. Um, and that would count, I think, as a kind of resistance. It's one of the kinds of resistance that we engage in. So, um, if you're trying to get me to come out, I can resist in that kind of a way by just resolving not to come out, no matter how much you badger me. Or I can resist in a more straightforwardly physical way by barricading my door, chaining myself to my desk, um, which is, of course, something I do all the time. Um, but I take it that when uh, people think that resistance is a philosophically interesting concept, they're most interested in resistance in the political context. And in that context, I want to say that resistance is indeed a form of this general non-acquiescence, but it's specifically non-acquiescence in political rule. Okay, so um, it's distinct in two senses from other forms of non interpersonal non-acquiescence resistance. It's distinct in the sense that it's political and it's distinct in the sense that it's uh, non-acquiescence in rule. All right, so 
Let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean um, before talking about some of the different forms of resistance. So political non-acquiescence is distinct from what we might call private non-acquiescence, um, the kind of non-acquiescence you might engage in as a private citizen. Um, so most obviously if I shirk my taxes on the quiet, if I, if I, is it evade or avoid that's the bad one? If I, if I evade my taxes, then there's a sense in which I'm resisting political rule. But I want to say that that's, in, an, in the ordinary case anyway, that's just private resistance. It's not, it's not interesting, it's basically self-interested <coughs> uh, shirking uh, and, and not, not to be classed as a kind of interesting political resistance. Um, so there's, I want to hive off political resistance from private resistance in that sort. And the same thing, there's, there's this standard example in political philosophy about the stop sign in the desert. Right, you're in the desert, you come across a stop sign, nobody around, should you stop? You know, are you under any duty to stop? And I, just putting aside the question about whether you're under any duty to stop, if you don't stop, was that an instance of resistance in any, uh, uh, in any interesting sense? I think not, right? That's, that's a private act of resistance. I mean, I can imagine cases where the, the political rule is so oppressive that Little, little acts of resistance that are invisible to everybody, including the, the rulers themselves, are the only form of political resistance that's available. And I think you know, there are novels and plays that deal with that very possibility. But I, don't, I think that's, a, in the normal case, that, that isn't resistance, right? So quietly, um, a bit like quiet shoplifting is not resistance to Tesco. Um, whereas public shoplifting might be, right? Um, and the other, the other thing that distinguishes political resistance is that it's non-acquiescence in political rule in particular. So that's distinct from, um, that's distinct from non um, <coughs> other forms of opposition, political opposition, um, which are nevertheless not resistance to the rule. Okay, so there are large numbers of ways to oppose what the state or government is doing which take place within the frameworks of the state and which are recognized within that framework as legitimate ways of opposing it. So most obviously, right, there's voting for, voting for the party that's not in government or um, standing for election oneself or writing letters or going, you know, going on lawful protests and so forth. So those are all, uh, those might be thought of as kinds of forms of resistance, but they're right at the edge of um, I, I think nobody's going to say that writing to your MP, I think, is, is political resistance. Um, whereas you might think that some forms of lawful process are. And so that gives rise to the idea that maybe there's a spectrum. Um, and I think that's probably right. Um, on one end of this spectrum, you've got... Um, so what, maybe I should say, off the end of the spectrum, beyond there, you've got something like writing to your MP, uh, opposing laws through the, the sort of the standard channels by which people are expected to try to get laws changed. And then just shading into the spectrum of actual political resistance is something like non-violent, non-disruptive civil disobedience. Um, so process like um, sometimes you can have uh, very public uh, refusal to pay council tax, for example, or something like that, which um, where you take on, you're willing to take on the uh, the legal penalties which are associated with such failure. That's not very disruptive, but it's a, it's taking a stand and it's doing it publicly and it's uh, taking a stand against the rule that imposes the tax. So that that would be an example right over at that end of the spectrum, and then. Over at this end of the spectrum, we've got sedition and, and violent revolution, right? Those are obviously forms of political resistance. Um, I don't think anybody's going to doubt that. And the ways in which uh, you might work out where to put something along this spectrum um, will involve distinguishing various oppositions and using those to sort <coughs> different instances of what might be thought to be resistance. So, you might distinguish between targeted 
resistance or resistance that's targeted at um, specific individuals or specific laws, which are the ones that are regarded as illegitimate or problematic in whatever way. Or you might have general resistance where uh, you, you, whether or not your cause has to do with specific laws or behaviours on the part of the state or the government, uh, your resistance takes general form. Right? So uh, non-compliance with any law, for example, at the, at the worst. And you, so revolution is most obviously, I take it that most revolutionaries, if they sat down and thought about it, would not think that every single thing that the state that they were revolting against um, had done was wrongful or illegitimate or unjust. But uh, nevertheless, revolution is a very general means of getting making the changes, right? It's not targeted. Um, there's, you can also distinguish, of course, between nonviolent and violent ways of resisting. Um, you can distinguish between disruptive and non-disruptive ways. You can distinguish between um, ways of resisting which have costs for the resistors, costs that they openly bear, um, and ways that don't. So if I am, for example, a functionary at civil service, uh, somebody in the civil service, and maybe I have the ability to make changes to law because I'm, I oversee the bit where they get onto the statute books and they actually get written down. Um, maybe I can make little changes there without being discovered. Um, so that would be non-sacrificial on the face of it. Um, there are also different things you can be meaning to do with your resistance, right? You can be seeking to uh, overthrow and take power yourself, or you can be seeking to <coughs> win sufficient support or recognition of the justice of a cause that the people who are in charge change their minds about what to do, or, or change their policies anyway. And finally, um, what you do can be open or it can be covert. Right? And so different resistance movements have different reasons for being open and for being covert. One reason to be open is because it makes it manifest that this is not an example of private, self-interested avoidance of compliance. Um, I have one reason to be covert is that uh, under plenty of regimes, being open about your resistance is a ticket to being um, at least jailed. Okay, so um, I think there are probably many other distinctions on the basis of which you might uh, place forms of resistance along this spectrum. There may be, so one way of thinking about it is there's lots of spectrums. Another way of thinking about it is these are lots of ways of distinguishing things along the spectrum. Um, and there are some, there's some really nice books which explore civil disobedience and, um, and resistance in exactly that mode. So one, one I know is Kimberly Brownlee's written a nice book on conscience and conviction, which distinguishes, among other things, between <coughs> conscience-based and um, conviction-based resistance. Um, but I don't want to talk more about different forms or, or, or what they involve. I hope this gives you a sense of the, the huge range of possibilities and also the importance of distinguishing between them and distinguishing between them partly because of the reasons that might justify resistance, might not justify any form of resistance whatsoever, right? They might, it might be relevant to the justification of any given instance of resistance, uh, whether it's one side or the other of any of these um, oppositions. Okay, so what I want to talk about um, is about the justification of resistance. So why, why resist? And the thing that's really interesting here is that on the face of it, resistance seems to call for special justification. Right? Um, there are just some reasons that just don't seem good enough for engaging in these forms of resistance. So, merely wanting to be better off, merely not liking the people who are in charge, merely wanting to do other than as you are required to do by law, Right, these don't look to most people like very good reasons. If, if you find somebody on the barricades and then you say, hey, why are you doing this? And they say, I would like to be richer. You know, the tax burden is a bit heavy. Yeah, 45% is, is too steep. Um, or if they say, I want to take drugs, the law says no drugs. 
you, I think you would, at least for some forms of resistance, you would think that is not a good enough reason. And so there's an, so, so the, the question that I'm interested in is not, you know, what, how much does the cost have to be to you before you can engage in this form of resistance? How much more does it have to be before you can engage in this other form of resistance? What I'm interested in is the presupposition that's implicit in the very thought that there needs to be some sort of justificatory story, the political rule is, in general, justifiable, right? It's the basic thought that's got to be operating in the background here is that there should be people in charge, or people in, it's okay for some people to be in charge. And to be in charge, let's not forget, of some pretty powerful machinery, right? The people who are in charge in the modern state are in charge of a hell of a lot of, of power. Right? They've got a lot on their side. They've got not only police forces, but also armies. Um, they've got the weight of law. They've got prison officers. They've got guns. And in, at least in the UK, they've got a lot more guns than everybody else. Um, and that's not always true, but it's true here. So it, it seems very interesting to me that we think Resistance to this stuff calls for special justification. You know, like if I came up to you with tanks and guns, you wouldn't need special justification to resist me. On the contrary, you'd need special justification not to resist me. Uh, you'd have to say, "I know he's a good guy, really." You know, like, people, are, why aren't you? Why aren't you trying to do what you can to stop him? Uh, well, I gave a nice lecture. Um, <laughs> whereas in the case of the state, the default assumption is that it's okay for the state to have that kind of power over us. Right? And that seems interesting to me. So, and, and it becomes more interesting when we start thinking, well, why? Why does it have that? Why, why, why is it okay for it to have that kind of power over us? If it were not okay for it to have that kind of power over us, you wouldn't need anything but a pragmatic justification <coughs> for, for, um, for resisting. Right? You, and, and in the case of the stop sign in the desert, you wouldn't need any justification at all. Right? In the stop sign, <coughs> if, if I say, to, if I go now, and stick a stop sign up somewhere near here, and I blow it up with some guns, but then I don't go anywhere near the stop sign so I don't actually see whether you're obeying or not, you have got no reason whatsoever to, to pay any attention to that stop sign, right? But, um, and so similarly, if the state is not entitled to have that kind of power, if it's not entitled to rule, then you have no reason to pay any attention to the stop sign in the desert. Now, of course, in other cases, laws tell you to do what you're already supposed to do independently. So most states have laws prohibiting murder. Um, and as you may know, murder is already wrong. So the fact that the state tells you to do it doesn't make a massive amount of difference to your reasons anyway. So if the state were illegitimate, if it had no right to go around ruling us, you'd still be <coughs> under that prohibition. But, um, but in lots of other cases, that's not true, and more generally, the, the presumption against resistance would be absent. So why? So what, what's the story that we are supposed to tell to make sense of um, this presumption against resistance? So let's start with um, some conceptions of political legitimacy in particular. Okay, so political legitimacy, I'm going to say, is whatever it is, that makes it true that there's a presumption against resistance. And as it turns out, in, in political philosophers distinguish between lots of different conceptions of legitimacy. So there, you can think that legitimacy is merely a power to create duty, so a moral power understood as the ability to bring it about that other people have a duty that they did not have before, for example. So one thing you might think is, so lawmakers, uh, make laws, right? That's what they do, as the, as the name suggests. And having made the law, once it's, once it's passed whatever procedures it's supposed to pass and becomes law, you now have some duty you didn't have before. Most obviously you have a legal duty, right? Um, and that's just a fact about positive law. But um, you might also think, and some people do think, you have a moral duty now too, where you, have not, you didn't have one necessarily before. So if that's true, if that's what they do, then lawmakers have, legitimate lawmakers have a moral power, that's what it's called, it's called a moral power. And you have, you are liable to have your duties changed about 
by that, by the exercise of that power. So that's one conception of political legitimacy. Another conception says it's not about, or not only about, the moral <coughs> power, the ability to create duties on the part of other people, it's also the, a kind of permission to go around forcing them to do it, to do what you said, right? So, and the, the force of this permission is that you are not wronged when they push you, right? So if the state is legitimate and it makes a law requiring, requiring me to do such and such, then if I don't do such and such and the state starts threatening me, it does no wrong in threatening me. <coughs> By contrast, if I do that to you, I do wrong, right? I'm not allowed to threaten you with imprisonment if you don't pay me 20% of your income or above a certain amount. That's not wrong. Um, and that, the difference between us is that the state's legitimate and I'm not. But if I were your legitimate ruler, then that would be fine. So on that conception, there'd be nothing that's that stuff, right? Nobody <coughs> is a legitimate ruler. All rulers are legitimate. And philosophical anarchists are often people who think political legitimacy is a matter of having a claim to obedience. So your philosophical anarch, which you might have noticed is the most extreme version of political legitimacy. So, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but I personally find it very impulsive to think I wrong the state if I don't obey the law. Like, you know, the state could feel a bit hurt. Um, that just seems ridiculous to me. Um, given that that seems ridiculous to me, it's no surprise that if you buy that account of political legitimacy, you're going to end up an anarchist. But if you have a weaker one, <coughs> anarchism might be a bit harder to justify. Anyway, accounts of political legitimacy in general are going to be stories about which of these is the right conception of something like that, and how anybody comes to have it, right? Because don't forget, in the end, in the end, being ruled is just a matter of other people saying stuff and doing stuff with the result that you are hemmed in in various ways. It's just other people. I mean, we, of course, the state is like a collective agent, you might think. You, you can have a conception of agency which allows that the state is a big collective agent, fine. But it's made up, nevertheless, of individuals. Right? And you all know what it's like to be under the power of another and how annoying that can be. And the fact that the state's very distant to many of us and that it's laws are kind of, we, we, we're, we're, we're used to them, we're used to working out our lives within the constraints represented by those laws, does not make it any the less true that you are under the authority of the state pretty much as you're really under the authority of your parents when you're three. Um, and you might think it's not very reasonable, or it better be, there had better be a really good justification for that. Okay, so accounts of political legitimacy purport to tell you what that would be. Um, I'm going to just quickly sketch three different kinds of account um, that are kind of the, probably the leading accounts in, in Anglophone analytic political philosophy. Um, so there are historical accounts, of which the best known is probably consent theory. Um, the basic idea of a historical account is that it's legit the ruler has legitimacy, so it follows that either you must obey and would wrong the ruler if you don't, or that the ruler may push you around without wronging you, <coughs> or that the ruler can create new duties in you, depends on your conception. The ruler has that ability or that power or that status because some transaction took place in the past through which the ruler came to have that power or status. Okay, and the model that people, consent theorists, give and um, that we can use for historical accounts more generally is the model of a promise. If I promise you that I'll do something, then now I am in a certain sense under your power, right? In a very, it's quite a restricted sense, but it's now up to you whether or not I do that thing to a large extent. I, I wrong you if I don't do it unless you release me from the promise. Or that, at least that's the story philosophers tell themselves, I have some doubts about that story, but um, we like it, we like it, we use it all the time. Um, 
So consent theorists think something very much like that. They think um, at some point people consent to the rule of the state, and because they consented, they're banned. Um, and you might notice that that's got to have more backstory, right? That's not enough. Um, part of the backstory is going to be how it comes to be that anybody has the power to consent to submission of that sort. And so usually uh, historical accounts are natural rights accounts. They have a story about humans and <coughs> what, what humans are like, and they say humans have natural rights of autonomy to, 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 um, to live as they see fit, and that includes a natural right to make contracts with other people, and that, inc that includes a right to um, uh, make agreements to submit to other people's rule. And they often come also with a story about why that might be a good idea. Because on the face of it, you might go, well, why, why, why would I do that? That seems stupid. But um, the story often goes something like, look, it's rational to submit because uh, if we don't submit, literally, it will be anarchy. Right? So it, it would indeed be literally, literally anarchy, nobody ruling. But the state of nature, as it's known, is a, uh, is a pretty horrible place because people are always getting all het up about who's done what and there's nobody to, there's nobody, there's no agreed arbitrator in their um, disagreements and, uh, you know, there are all sorts of coordination problems and so it's just a really good idea. If you find yourself in the state of nature ever, please, the consent theorists say, quickly go and consent to a state. Find somebody and say, look, rule me, I'll consent to it. That'll, that'll sort of thing say. Um, and different, once you see that, you see that <coughs> historical theories don't have to be consent theories, they just need to be kind of historical transaction theories. Right? So one of the most famous historical theories is Robert Nozick's, and that's not actually a consent theory, it looks like it on the face of it, but it's not really. A bunch of people make contracts to provide protection for each other, insurance basically, in the state of nature because of all the crappiness that I just described. Um, and, but then it turns out that you're in the wrong. You do not have a natural right to hold out against being ruled if your holding out represents a kind of certain kind of a risk to other people. And that's just, that's just as it were, coded into the natural rights that Nozick starts with. And so it follows via several steps and via some historical moves that the state must morally emerge, or more or less must morally emerge, and so it's okay that it does. Okay, so that's, but, but the story about why you and I here and now have to, can, have to obey the state has to do with that story that's happened in the past, and everything that we get now is just the result of subsequent transactions. The state, you know, the state never gave up its legitimacy or anything like that. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's the rough form of a historical account. Um, I'll say something about some problems with it in a minute, but um, I'm sure some of them are obvious. Um, a second kind of account is the self-interest accounts. They're, they're, they're quite rare these days, but they do exist. Um, most famously, they're associated with Hobbes. The thought is very similar to the consent. So the consent theorist doesn't think you're obliged, doesn't think rule is established legitimately until you have consented, until you've transferred your authority over yourself to somebody else. But the consent theorist, as I said, has to tell some story about why the hell anyone would do this. And what happens in the self-interest accounts is that they just skip the bit about the transfer. They just say, look, it's, the state of nature is terrible, it's massively in your interest that there should be a state, and that's why it's okay that there's a state. And the state can't do the things it's supposed to do unless it has the power that, um, that is associated with legitimacy. So, so suck it up. Right, that's, that's roughly the story. So, um, hot we owe to Hobbes, the well-known phrase, um, nasty, brutish, <coughs> and short. Um, I'm not totally sure that's actually verbatim, but it's close. Um, life in the state of nature is nasty, brutish, and short, because um, uh, even the strongest is no match for uh, an alliance of the weakest. And so everybody's vulnerable. You can't, you know, I mean, there, there's a kind of, there's a gruesome version and a non-gruesome version. The gruesome version is you're going to be slaughtered. The non-gruesome version is, um, you know, you put something down, 
turn around and you look back and it's gone. You can't, you can't build a life, right? It's, 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 and so you, nothing, nothing works. Nobody, nobody trusts anybody. Nobody's, none, none of the things that make life tolerable um, are available. And so um, it's the, the presence, that's enough to tell us that the great power of the state is okay. Because the great power of the state is needed to make life tolerable because the great power of the state is needed to make sure that people's self-interest is lined up with, is, is harmonious, right? So if I'm just acting self-interestedly and the penalties for acting in ways that are antisocial are powerful enough, then my self-interest aligns with yours. And so that's, that's the story, right? That's why the state's justified. We need it for our own good. And then finally, we have, I think these are the, the dominant contemporary views now, Natural duty accounts. So natural duty accounts are kind of the, the, the kind of the mirror image of the self-interest ones, right? Where the self-interest ones try to appeal to what you, what's good for you, to explain why you should be subject to the power of the state. The natural duty accounts explain they, they appeal to, the, to other people's interest to explain why you should be subject to the power of the state. And the rough form is: look, everybody's got a duty either to save other people from desperate peril if they can do so without too much great um, cost to themselves, or everybody has a duty to try and bring about justice in some sense, or um, everybody, uh, the, the, condition, the condition in which there is no legitimate power is a condition in which we cannot be morally in the clear. It's just not possible to live like that and be morally in the clear because your relations with other people are necessarily um, marked by heteronomy or domination or something like that. And so the state is justified as a way to help us do what we need to do, what we must do morally. Okay, so you can see that it's similar in structure to the self-interest account, but it's the, the set of reasons it appeals to are, are broadly altruistic or moral reasons, not altruistic moral, um, whereas the reasons that the self-interest accounts, self-interest accounts appeal to are not like that. Okay, so um, this... I mean, there's different ways of interpreting different philosophers, but this is probably best associated most with, uh, it's a, the best known association is with Kant and with Rawls. And Rawls is, of course, a Kant in science, so it's surprising. Um, so what are the implications of all this for questions about resistance and its justification? So I, I hope it's relatively clear from what I've said so far that, um, the different accounts are going to set different justificatory bars that you need to clear in order to <coughs> engage in resistance. Right, so, um, and again, don't forget that there's this whole spectrum. So, where you know, I suppose the, the, the sort of your, the algorithm would be first identify a form of resistance that is being contemplated on place it on spectrum, then look to account of political legitimacy to discover what the bar is for justification, and then find out whether this particular form clears the bar. If it doesn't, move left until it does, or don't resist at all if it never does. Um, and if it does, see if you can budge right if you want. Um, so that's, that's going to be roughly the story. And you can see that exactly how high the bar is, so whether any given form of resistance that's being proposed is going to be justified on this sort of view. Um, it's going to be a matter of what the correct story is about the justification of these rules. Um, and so, and, and that in turn is going to be a matter of what values were being appealed to in the argument for a political rule in the first place, and a matter of what the conception is. So just to, to make the conception point clear, remember that one of the, um, one of the conceptions made political legitimate political legitimacy a matter of claim to obedience. And another of them made it a matter of not wronging people by wielding power over them. So the bar that you have to clear on the face of it is going to be higher in the first than in the second. Right? Because not if you're not wronging me by using force against me, that says nothing about whether I'm wronging you by root using force in return. All right, so the, the, the kind of classic example of um, the sort of 
right that the state would have in this case is the right you have to sit on a park bench. Right, so you have every right to sit on a park bench, as indeed you might say to somebody who was saying, don't sit on that park bench. But that doesn't entitle you to push somebody else off that park bench, right? Um, if you sit on the park bench, then you're probably welcome to, you've done nothing wrong. Um, but equally, if somebody beats you to it, they've done nothing wrong. It's not your park bench. And so similarly, that the state does nothing wrong in pushing you around does not show that if you can avoid the pushing, or push back, you're doing anything wrong. So the bar that needs to be cleared in that case looks a hell of a lot lower than the bar that needs to be cleared in the case of a conception and an account of political legitimacy, which say that political legitimacy gives the state a claim to your obedience. Because then, even if you're quietly dodging the law without doing any damage, you're still disobeying, and that's, that's the thing you're not supposed to do. State's legitimate. So that's going to be part of the story of where, what resistance clears the bar. And the other part, and the more, the more important part, not least because it also turns out to tell you what conception of political legitimacy to adopt, is going to be the value of your opinion. So here's an obvious way in which that's going to be true. The self-interested account, right? If you go for a self-interest account, obviously if the state, if, if you can show <coughs> you, if, if it's true that the state is not in your interest, then it's not legitimate. Right, so, um, and Hobbes recognised this, and Hobbes, for that reason, thought that the point where the state condemns you to death, ah, it's, got, it's got nothing on you, right? because nothing, as far as he's concerned, nothing's going to be, you know, the state of nature's better than that for you, or at least no worse. And so, uh, the state's authority just stops the moment it starts trying to kill you. Um, now, you might think that's true anyway, whether or not you're a Hobbesian, but it's just, it, it just falls out of Hobbes' picture. Um, it's got nothing to do with morality, it's got to do with the way that the state's legitimacy is established on the whole team picture. Um, but other accounts, it'll have to do with moral questions. So if, you're, if you adopt a natural duty of justice, justice account, the question's going to be, is the state doing whatever it is that states are supposed to do in respect of justice? Is it bringing about justice or just state of affairs or sufficiently just state of affairs? If it's not, it's not legitimate. If it's not legitimate, then it can't push you around, or it's got no claim to obedience, or it's not the duties it purports to impose upon you are not real duties, and so on. So here's a couple of examples. Consent theory, right? The core conception of legitimacy is the right to rule, that's the claim to obedience. The justification, as I said, appeals to natural <coughs> rights. Um, so the, legitimate, the, the limits of legitimacy are going to be determined by the limits of what you can consent to or what you did consent to. So, um, hypothetically, you might think, I cannot consent, I, I, since I have no right to kill my neighbor in the state of nature, <coughs> I cannot give to the state that right. So whereas I have the right, for example, to, um, what do I have the right to do? I have the right to all sorts of stuff. With, um, I have the right to stick my fist through my own computer screen. Right? So if I want, I can give the state that right by just saying, you know, I, I hereby contract, I give you the computer, or at least that right over it. But, so the limits of what I can consent to are partly a function of the limits of what rights I have in the first place. So at the point where the state starts um, punishing people in a way that I wouldn't have had a right to do if it were, if we were in the state of nature, or carrying out things that no individual could have had the authority to do in the state of nature, at that point it loses its legitimacy on the consent picture. But of course, as I said before, everything's going to turn on, therefore, the picture of natural rights that you think is the right one in the first place. And so people like Locke, people like Nozick, they are concerned first and foremost to establish what our natural rights are, because that's going to tell you the whole story. Um, the wrinkle with historical consent theories is, of course, the hypothetical consent, um, as I think Tolkien once said, is not worth the paper is not written on. So um, it's really neither here nor there how much I could have consented to. What's relevant is how much I or whoever's consent counts did consent to. So if it turns out that your forebears, and let's put aside the problem of like forebears consent finding <laughs> their descendants. Um, if they consented to much less than the state's doing, even though it would have been rational for them to consent to more, 
then the state's not legitimate. Um, and the arguments for which rights we have and what consent does typically go via interpersonal analogies. None of us, I don't think, have lived in anything that looks like a state of nature. Um, well, looks like a state of nature, maybe the bop, but is a state of nature. Uh, none of us have lived uh, in one of those. And so we really can't say, oh, these are the rights. In it. We can't just appeal to the rights we know we have in the state of nature in order to explain um, what consent, how much consent does. So typically, uh, philosophers going down this line appeal to mechanisms of consent that are actually legal and um, moral now, right? So they, they talk about promises and they talk about legal contracts. And then they just sort of say, all the rights that we associate with those things here and now, oh, it turns out that we have them naturally, or some, some, something like that. And so that's how the argument goes. And so if you're interested in either trying to vindicate <coughs> or trying to um, argue against consent theory, that's the work you need to get down and dirty with. Um, again, a bit like a book. Um, Another example, Kant's Republican natural duty view. So Kant's view is a natural duty view in the rough sense that he thinks being in the state of nature is being in a morally objectionable position. So you'd better get the hell out of it, and that's what justifies the state. And the state needs to, you need the state to get out of it. The story is that um, we are inevitably in relations of domination if we try to have anything in the state of nature. So if I try to um, have anything as my own, I am assuming that I have rights over that stuff, and if I have a right over it, you have duties with respect to it. If, if, this, uh, if, if this watch is mine, then you would be stealing it if you took it. It's not, it's not like a bit of grass in a commons. You would be stealing it. So for me to have anything in the state of nature is me to assume that you have duties. Where did they come from? Well, the options seem to be that they came from nowhere, that doesn't seem very plausible, or that they came from me. But then if I'm able to make laws for you, there's something I miss about our relationships because who, who made me boss, right? So you need a state to be the boss that makes the rules that allows us to have anything. And can things, we do need to have stuff because we are beings who, uh, I, don't, I don't think Kant says this, but Kant interprets it, we are purposive beings. We're beings who have projects and we, we make lives and we need property to do that stuff. Some property, you know, even if it's just the clothes on your back. Um, so Kant thinks uh, that's the justification of the state, that's why the state's legitimate. legitimate. Um, the limits of legitimacy are obviously determined simply by what's necessary for it to, to, to have that kind of um, uh, non-dominating boss role. And that means that Kant's state is relatively minimal. Um, and states which try to go beyond that, for example, by legislating for the welfare of their citizens, uh, by using taxes to fund sporting events, um, and a whole lot of other stuff, all that stuff's illegitimate on a Kantian picture, or on the face of it. Now, of course, lots of Kantians are a bit bothered by this because they like Kant and they like the Kantian story. It's got it's quite philosophically attractive, but they really want it to be okay for the state to fund sporting events or, or whatever, or, 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 or to fund tax credits. Um, and so they, they uh, bend over backwards to try and find ways that that story can accommodate it. One way you might do that is you might say, look, the fundamental story is about domination. The reason it's not okay in the state of nature for me to make the rules is because I am not, I, I, that would be for me to dominate you. Um, because those rules, the rules of property are coercively enforceable, I can, I can take stuff away from you. Um, so that would be to dominate you. So domination is the big problem. So the Kantian state should provide um, benefits to people who can't provide for themselves or um, because that comes <coughs> from being dominated. So it's all perfectly harmonious. And it doesn't look like what Kant thinks, but it's certainly a kind of Kantian story that you can make and people have. Okay. So um, each of these accounts, as, as I'm sure is relatively obvious now, each of these accounts is going to have all sorts of niggles and puzzles that are generated. So, for example, um, most obviously, the biggest problem for historical consent theories is explaining how the fact that some people in the past consented has anything to do with me. 
right now, some consent theorists say, oh, no, no, you consented because you voted or because you, uh, you availed yourselves of the benefits of the state. But as um, but very old objections point out, for example, that if you didn't have the choice, then it doesn't really count. Um, and further objections point out that we normally think that in order to have consented, it has to have been very, very obvious what you had to do to refuse consent, and that's not true, and various other objections. So there's, there's lots of puzzles about consent theory right there. Um, similarly, um, all right, yes, so for the, for the Kantian, um, for the Kantian account that I just described, uh, one puzzle that I think is pretty difficult to get around is to explain why it is that merely having on the hat, as it were, of legislator gets rid of all of those worries about who makes the law, right? And then, you, of course, you can say something about democracy, but if you're on the losing side of it, you know, if, I, if we're in the state of nature and I stand up and I say, I'm, let's have a vote on what the law is, um, and you go, no, hang on, what, who made you, like, what, how did that become the process by which this, the law gets made? Who made you the decider of that? And I say, shut up, we're doing it. You're, you, you're not going to think that's legitimate, so why is it, why does it make any difference that we've got a thing called the state and people <coughs> with official positions? So why do official positions take away the problem of domination in the way that a Kantian needs to suppose? Um, a particularly thorny puzzle that, um, I, people are working on at the moment, um, is the problem of what's called legitimate injustice. Um, so, legitimate injustice is what it sounds like. It's a wrong done by the government or by the state, which nevertheless doesn't uh, make it illegitimate. And it's actually quite tricky to explain how that could be possible. And yet, sh I'm pretty sure that almost everybody does take it to be possible. So I take it that almost nobody in this room thinks that any existing state is fully just. Maybe many of you think that most of them are pretty heftily unjust. And yet at the same time, most people in this room probably think that there is that bar that you have to cross if you want to start resisting. There has to be some story you can tell about which goes beyond the fact of sort of ordinary common or garden injustice. So, I mean, to take an example, there couldn't be much more of a grave injustice than the um, imprisoning or execution of innocent people, but we know that our systems of justice will imprison innocent people all the time. So if I find myself, it, it, one of the sort of cases that animates people, if I'm the prison officer and I know that the, prison, the prisoner is innocent because I have privileged access to that, you know, I, 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 was, I was there on the night and I saw it, but for some reason my testimony was not available to the court, or the court just didn't take it seriously. Is there any reason for me to keep the person in? You know, I've got the keys, I can let them out, they can get away. Doesn't look like I, why, why should I not? It doesn't, it's very hard to explain why I shouldn't. And yet I think lots of us think, no, 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 you, you know, just don't, if the prison system, if the this justice system's done its job, and the, you know, even we know people will be innocent who are in, we've got to go through the appeals, blah, 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 blah. That's quite hard to explain, right? Because um, if you adopt this natural duty of justice view, then the reason that the state has the power to lock anybody up in the first place is that it, that it, it behaves justly, it doesn't justly. So if this system is unjust in any sense, um, then it's really not clear why anybody should pay any attention to it. Um, now, people have argued from democracy, they said that, you know, um, take social injustice, right? So um, there are lots of conceptions of social injustice. Suppose that you are completely sure, you're, you know, you're a, you're a moral philosopher, very, very sure of yourself. Uh, you think um, the, the state is unjust, socially unjust, and um, continuing to be socially unjust. Why should you, you know, not alter the tax law quietly if you've got the power to do that um, so that it's a slightly more just or whatever, or change the sentencing regime to a slightly more just because you, you, know, you, can, you can muck around the statute books because you happen to be that civil servant. Um, one reason people give is, well, you know, people's democratic rights have been violated, but it's quite hard to explain why my right to have a say extends to a right to bring it to make it the case that injustices are done in a story about political rule which makes justice the primary value. Similarly, people have talked about reasonable disagreement. You know, people reasonably disagree about what's just and what's unjust. 
and there has to be that you know those disagreements must be worked out in some sort of democratic sense. You can't just stand on what you think is um, the right view and bang your fist. But the problem is that there's no there's no reason in advance anyway to think that the reasonable unreasonable distinction lines up with the um, egregious no the the acceptable injustice and egregious injustice distinction. So one example might be um, about abortion, right? So suppose uh, lots of people think it's reasonable to disagree about abortion. I'm not taking a stand on that here, but suppose that it were reasonable to disagree about abortion. There's no reason to think in advance that the reason of, the fact that it's reasonable shows that the injustice is tolerable if it's in fact um, wrong, if abortion is wrong, right? I mean, the, if abortion is wrong, it's egregiously wrong, it's terribly wrong, if, you know, given the reasons that um, anti-abortion um, activists give for thinking it's wrong. So it's not like they can just say, well, you know, these are, it's reasonable to disagree, and so um, even though I think it's wrong, you know, it's not a wrong worth getting hit up about. That's, that's just not, that just doesn't look likely to be true across the board anyway. So, um, so the kinds of things that you might naturally appeal to to try and make sense of the legitimate injustice look like they're unavailable. And uh, I, this puzzle has not, to my knowledge, been solved. Uh, it's, a, it's a tricky one. And it might be a reason to just give up on the natural justice, duty of justice approach, or it might be um, a reason to do something else, or maybe there's a solution that hasn't been seen yet. Um, finally, some deeper doubts. Um, one, one worry you might have, especially if you're not already drenched in analytic political philosophy, is that the whole shebang is misconceived and wrong-headed. Um, I think there's something to this, but it's very, very difficult to put one's finger on. So one way that the, the kind of doubt I have in mind here has been expressed is by saying that politics, uh, is, politics is an autonomous, distinct sphere. It's not part of morality in a straightforward sense. So you have um, political realists who say, all the kind of stuff I've just been doing is um, a mis- If that's not what we're supposed to do, it's not very obvious what we are supposed to do. So one, one, um, one direction in which you might go at this point is um, towards Marxist analyses um, or critical theory analyses. So that there the thought is, what you're trying to do is um, trace out the power relations and show how the things that sustain them might be debunkable, right? So as to bring out um, the ways in which actually um, the power relations are oppressive. So the fundamental thought that underpins critical theory approaches and to some extent Marxist approaches is that some people have the short end of the stick and those people need to be freed. So the, you can't really do that without some sort of moral philosophy. You make that kind of a claim. But what you don't do is start doing moral philosophy about the, the as it were, the relations between... Um, you, don't, you don't do interpersonal bourgeois moral philosophy about when you're looking at the relations between the ruler and the rules. You take the power relation to be fundamental and then you ask, what, is there something that can be said to the people on the wrong end of the power relation that um, will make them aware of the, um, the of the need for emancipation. If you can't, maybe that's enough to vindicate. But maybe that's all you need for political legitimacy. That there's no no uh, internal critique, imminent critique, which will take. And then, so maybe the story of legitimacy here is just, and the story of resistance is, if you can get enough people to join you at the barricades then the state is not legitimate. If you can, it is. Okay, so that's what I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we really enjoyed listening to that. I certainly found it very interesting. Um, I study history, so often my perspective on resistance is a little bit different. Um, but it's very refreshing to hear a different disciplinary perspective on things. Okay, uh, so I think we're now going to move on to the Q&A section for a little bit. Where do you want um, me? 
So, do you want to sit next to me here? Sure. Thank you so much. Very nice of you. Um, so, I'm going to ask the first question because, because I can. Um, and after that, I'm going to open it up to the floor. Um, so, I was wondering, you, you sort of said that obviously resistance kind of needs a good reason for it, um, that it needs to kind of be justified. Um, I was wondering sort of how you square that with the idea that resistance sometimes tends to kind of cascade in, in, in history. So you sort of start with an internal political squabble and then all of a sudden you kind of have more violence and often you know, the justification kind of precedes the fact. So I was just wondering how you reconcile that idea that resistance needs legitimate justification with the fact that sometimes action precedes thought. So, um, so you mean, when you say action precedes thought, you mean action precedes the kind of full justification of the action? Yeah, no, that, that, that seems right. I don't think that means that there are no questions of justification to be raised. I mean, typically, actions which precede their justifications, we know that because we then ask for the justification, and then we find it lacking or not. So I don't think that, I mean, absolutely, the, the way things, as it happens, turn out, um, doesn't follow a kind of, you know, philosopher's study, deliberation, justification, right, if I go, for sure. But nevertheless, we do engage in, all the time, in the project of trying to work out whether or not what happened was good, justified, whether the people are to be um, held responsible, whether we're willing to take responsibility. I mean, like, uh, the, the example you gave was really nice, right? The, in, there is a point at which the question gets raised about the, 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 the people who began the process, whether they take responsibility for the results, the mob violence. Mm -hmm. And that's a really difficult question. Yeah. And um, so it, it seems to me that questions of justification crop up all the time. And we don't just sort of watch and see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, right, I'm going to open up now to the floor. Um, okay, so uh, maybe uh, just, yeah. Hi, um, I'm Lindsay. I'm a lawyer interested in environmental law. And my question is, what happens to civil disobedience theory um, if we dissolve the paradigm of the state, um, especially in the context of environmentalism, um, such as rebellion, um, it's your classic uh, kind of global transnational collective action problem? Yeah, right. I mean, I agree, yes, it is. It is a massive collective action problem. I don't know. I mean, you said, what happens if we dissolve the power of the state? Is that what you said? Yeah, sort of, because most of civil disobedience theory is premised on uh, you know, concepts of uh, uh, contractual or social contract theory. Um, it's all very nation-based. Yes. Yeah. So, I, I mean, so if we dissolve that paradigm in the sense that we start asking about global resistance, I suppose the question is going to be, well, what's the resistance mm -hmm. to? And at the moment, most of these forms of resistance take the form of national resistance to national law and so forth. I mean, there is the odd th things like Davos and um, uh, international organizations get some protest, but the kind of resistance there is always resistance to whatever local laws or, no, or not resistance in that sense at all. So I, don't, I mean, as long as the laws that apply to us as individuals are state-based laws, I don't see any prospect of dissolving the paradigm mm -hmm. in, in that, well, theoretically. I mean, I can see that there might be alternatives to the state. There were. I mean, the state's a very young thing. Mm -hmm. um, and in those, under those uh, regimes, I suppose those global regimes, I guess resistance is to whatever political authority is the one that puts you in prison or burns you at the stake indeed. Mm -hmm. um, but in all I guess in all cases it looks like whether your whether your movement is global or not, resistance 
it, it, as I said at the start, right, it's opposition to something, so you need something to oppose, and the thing that we always end up faced with are relatively local police forces. Does that help? I feel like that doesn't answer the question, but I'm not quite sure what would. No, 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 it, it, it clarifies. So I was just thinking, you, know, you mentioned um, like natural duty theory. Mm. Uh, people could use more kind of deontological justifications against, you know, um, it's, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, um, even if I live in, say, Germany, who is uh, kind of outlawed, uh, was closing down coal plants. Like, it doesn't matter that my state is doing enough. Uh, I'm still going to protest because... Yeah, okay, good, yeah. yeah. Yeah, right, good. That's really interesting because... Okay, so no, no, now I see what you're getting at. So the stories about political legitimacy yeah. are stories about roughly the nation-state, typically. And then the question is, if the nation-state's not failing in itself, but there's some collective failure, mm -hmm. what's the story about opposition going to be? Yeah, that's a really great question, actually. I, um, there is some work by people um, like Thomas Pogger and some... Um, some people who've written on um, uh, climate justice, on global dis sort of civil disobedience for global reasons, but um, and, and one of the paradigms that gets used is the cosmopolitan, roughly a kind of natural rightsy cosmopolitanism. So then the thought is that um, your state is just like the its justification, insofar as it's justified, is. Um, is owed to the part it can play in, in a global um, implementation of a just world. Well, obviously, yeah. um, so that's how they get the that's how they get the, the um, sort of natural duty stuff to line up with global concerns. Mm -hmm. But it's true that um, insofar as the story is the the the, the, the account of political legitimacy is, is state focused. Mm -hmm. Then there's some interesting puzzles about collective, like global collective action problems, yeah. Uh, Hi. Um, you talk about resistance as <coughs> disobeying political authority and about justifying that fact. But wouldn't that then mean if, if someone goes on protests and marches mm -hmm. which aren't against the law, so they're allowed by the authority, then they're just not really resisting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think, I think that, I mean, of course, it's up to you and to me to define our terms any way we want, but I, I take it that there's something like loyal opposition and lawful opposition, and then there's, at some point, it becomes something that seems more like resistance, the way I'm thinking of it. Um, if you don't think that carves up the use of the term resistance properly, then maybe I just want to say, look, there's resistance can be lawful, and then it can be start to shade into the unlawful, and then it can be the outright revolutionary, and the bar just gets higher. It just doesn't look to me like the bar is high at all for anything that's lawful. So, you know, if I, if I come to you and I say, we must resist, write your MP, or go on a lawful process, protest, you know, I feel like I'm, yeah, I've, I've just said something that more or less undermines my first claim. But, I, you, I mean, maybe you hear it differently. Uh, so collective resistance almost presumes kind of the line of interest of parties, and yet so much of so within feminist discourse you can bring up intersectionality, and loads of people kind of say that womanhood actually is not defined at all. The same way in environmental policies, people argue that it will actually impact developing countries, and you know, so all of that. So how do we resist? without, you know, frag fragmenting the unified front is detrimental to the cause, but without doing so, we actually are possibly undermining the cause itself. Yeah, right, so, I mean, that's something that I'm struggling with right now. Um, I, I, one of the reasons I'm so shambolically dressed is because I was uh, a meeting with, um, so I'm right, you may know that Extinction Rebellion has been um, attacked from both sides of the political spectrum for being white middle class, and um, I'm interested in the exactly what form that attack takes and what its power is. But writing about that is, as you can imagine, a dangerous game. Okay. Um, there are problems of optics as well as substance, and the, the, the white middle class male academic <coughs> pronouncing on the justice of these critiques is a risky 
it, it, it is, is something I, I got to be very careful about. And so um, I was discussing it with somebody, um, and it went on for a long time. So, um, so I, I, I feel the force of those worries very strongly. I suppose I don't think. Well, I mean, this is part. Of, uh, there's, there's, there are substantive philosophical questions, and there are political strategic questions. And the strategic questions, I'm not particularly well qualified to answer. Um, you know, I have I have views, and the views are uh, try to unite everybody at the same time as not um, as not dissolving the motivations of the people that are involved. Right? So, you, if you if you try to unite, if if you if you try to uh, reach too widely, then you will lose your base, and if you try to please your base, you'll lose the reach. So um, these are boring and obvious um, considerations. And I don't know what the right thing to do is. Fortunately, I'm not in charge of it, so um, I don't have to. Uh, the philosophical questions, I think, are really interesting. I, th um, uh, I think that questions of intersectionality and perspective and, and, and who gets to speak for whom um, are really important. I think that they can be overstated in the sense that I think that whether or not um, it's what kind of a fault it is to um, to be and to speak from a perspective, a privileged perspective, for example, varies with context. So I think that um, to take a familiar example. The whiteness of Oxbridge is more of a problem than uh, the whiteness of Extinction Rebellion, right? Because Oxbridge is a locus of power and influence, and Extinction Rebellion, alas, is not, or not, not to the same degree. Um, so that's not to say I don't think that the whiteness of Extinction Rebellion is a problem, I think it is, but I think that the force of the objection against it differs from the force of the same objection <coughs> leveled against. And I think, so those are the kinds of philosophical considerations I think are relevant. I don't have a, like a worked out view of that. Uh, is there anyone at the back that would like to ask a question? I'm just conscious that I've sort of prioritized the front. Yeah, okay. Um, so it was, I really enjoyed the bit at the end where you were sort of questioning the anglophone um, approach to it. Mm. And that made me think, I was thinking at the beginning of the talk, the resistance might not actually be the right word. Right. Because it seems to me that if, when you sort of started with this, what do we actually mean by resistance in a non-political sense? You yeah. started with things which are something getting away in the way of another thing. Yeah. And of course, there's that you know, you know, well written about uh, Foucaultian critique of kind of um, understands of cons understanding of power as constraint um, instead of so sort of that negative dimension of power as opposed to positive dimension of power. Sure. And I'm never really sure why that's never ta been taken up by you know. Anglophone speakers. So I suppose there's one of them. Is there something that I'm missing in anglophone um, philosophy which sort of tends to not enjoy that kind of creative form of power? And yeah. secondly, is there a way to reconstruct sort of the analytic anglophone discourse on um, resistance that might um, sort of deal a bit better with those those questions and sort of whatever the sort of correlative of resistance is? Yeah, yeah, so sort of theorize that. Those are great questions. So the, the, the first question I think is might be answered uh, sort of sociologically but relatively simply. So I don't think Anglophone political philosophers have any objection to the Foucaultian analysis of power. The point is that they're not that interested in analyzing power. So you know they, they accept, you know, they they've read um, Foucault and they've read other people analyzing power in the Foucaultian tradition and also outside it, but they don't, because they don't think of the primary questions of politics in terms of power, they're not particularly moved to do anything about that, right? So, it, um, so I mean, that, I, it's very hard for me to be sure that I'm capturing the thinking of my predecessors and contemporaries accurately here, but my feeling is that they are moral philosophers and political philosophers in the analytic tradition are often very preoccupied by questions of right and wrong, and those questions turn into when 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 we come to power, they just turn into the question is is it right or wrong for this person to have it and to wield it 
and in these ways. So they're perfectly aware, and there's lots written on, um, some of the mechanisms of power that Foucault has in mind, just not described as power, right? So the questions about what is an infringement on autonomy uh, go way beyond a kind of a simple, um, a, a kind of simple Hobbesian account of constraint. Way beyond, right? There's loads of really interesting stuff on manipulation and autonomy and heteronomy and domination and all the rest of it. Um, but they're just never framed as questions of power, they're framed as questions of justice, roughly speaking. And that's really, that's just been the most fruitful source of the kind of philosophy that people in this tradition have wanted to do. I think, I think things are changing. Um, and certainly there's the, the old sort of anarchy continental divide is long dead. But, um, but I think the, the, the basic, could, it, could, it, could something be reconstructed so that there was kind of resistance? Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Give it a try. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. So a lot of the discussion has been kind of the state of the main actor at the top, and then it's kind of in, it's interest state rather than um, you know, yep. the individual resist yeah. is resistant to state. Yep. What do you make of, and do you think this kind of framework works for potential interstate resistance? So say you've got, I don't know, a state of the Maldives who are going to be threatened far more oh, yeah, 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 right. than other states. Do we need some sort of new mm -hmm. framework, or can that be fitted round into what we have now? So, um, there's a question about approach, and there's a question about specifics of the approach, right? So, the, the specifics, the specifics of the approach aren't going to work quite as well. Uh, well, they're just not going to work for interstate questions, so long as you accept a state system as your paradigm. Right, there, will, there will be questions that are perfectly tractable in the same sorts of vocabularies, but they're not going to be the same questions. So you know people like people have, there was a massive boom in um, in uh, articles and books on global justice in the, from about two thousand to about two thousand and eleven. Um, it's very specific at the moment. Um, and they they all worked on so, you know, lots of them questioned the international paradigm and went for a cosmopolitan, so-called cosmopolitan paradigm. Other ones worked with the, within the kind of um, uh, what's it called, the, post, the Westphalian system, um, and you know there were lots of fights about that. So rules wrote on global justice, and um, uh, Thomas Pogge had some very influential stuff on global justice, and people like Cecil Fowler, our own Cecil Fowler, was um, writing one. Cosmopolitan global justice. So the, that stuff does fit into that paradigm. Then there's this different question, which is does the general analytical approach handle that kind of question well? And I think probably <coughs> certainly no better than it handles the domestic paradigm. And if you're skeptical about the way that it handles the domestic paradigm, then definitely not. Um, and I think maybe the reason to think that is because IR is a different thing from um, DR, domestic relations, whatever, whatever it is, I don't know what it's called, politics. Um, it, it's a different kind of politics, right? And in particular, the threat of war plays a different role. Um, and secure, security is what it would be called. Um, so I think that you're thinking about that it would have to be different. Um, in what ways precisely, I'm not sure. Um, well, thank you so much. I hope we have another round of applause. Uh, I hate to bring our very uh, intellectual discussion back to just to sort of pitch for the BSHR, um, but um, I will just mention that week four is our next um, workshop, and it's going to be a little bit more of a sort of historical and literary approach to resistance, um, highly recommend it. Um, and it's going to be very interesting, uh, particularly if that's maybe not necessarily your discipline. Um, definitely your, the ways that you think about things will definitely be challenged. Um, and um, yeah, as I said before, um, we will have a laptop up there if you'd like to put your email in and sign up to the mailing list um, so that you never miss a BSHR event. 
And finally, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, it's been very interesting. Some of your questions have been uh, fascinating and would never have occurred to me. So on a personal level, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, refreshments are provided. Um, so please feel free to stay around and mingle. And thank you. I hope, we hope to see you at the next BSHR event. Thank you.